Global picture on this: 27 million known slaves in the world, 3 million kids sold into sex markets around the world every year, and those are just our best estimates because it's all a black market. It's off the radar. So there's no real numbers. They estimate as many as 30 million just in India. I was in when I was in Bangkok last time. They have 3 million registered girls that work the bars for customers. They do it for room and board, and they service all the customers. So. Huge problems all over the world. As we started learning what's happened here in the United States, uh, it's 2005 when it really became the awareness of what's happening here within our borders. 2009, USA became known as the number one destination for child sex trafficking of all the countries in the world. Uh, last year, we're number two for adult female sex trafficking of all the countries in the world. So, although it's not right out in the open like you might see it in other countries, uh, there. It is here, happening under the radar. In fact, the State Department calls it hidden in plain sight. So, when I first learned Oklahoma was ranked number four in the nation, I'm not sure our ranking now. Uh, we know California, Texas, Florida, New York. New York are the top states for this problem. Within the secondary states are the next. Texas is number two in the nation for this problem. We're close to them. But Houston's the number one city for child sex trafficking. Las Vegas is number two. Kansas City is number four, tied with Portland. St. Louis is number five, tied with New York. When you think about where Oklahoma sits, those profitable cities, and that they move them from city to city, location to location, we're considered the crossroads of the nation. So a lot of activity happens here. In 2004, FBI set up a special operation here in Oklahoma City called Stormy Night, where they rescued 100 girls out of our truck stop that were being sold for sex there and forced prostitution, youngest of which was 13. Over 30 of them were underage. Uh, they've made a video on that. It's now a documentary. It's been released. When you speak to the State Department and the groups that work in this, in this special unit under human, under uh, the Department of Homeland Security, they talk about who is the worst in the nation. They say Oklahoma. I don't think we're the worst. I think that you know areas out in California and, and uh, other areas are probably worse. But because they first found it here and they were so young average age of girls that are recruited from the sex industry here in Oklahoma is between 12 and 13. They're so young here that it really shocked the nation, shocked the FBI, what they learned. In fact, while they were monitoring the truckers and setting up on those investigations, there was this idea when you're calling, you know, from country to country, east to west coast across the country, there was this idea, go through Kansas City if you want a good barbecue, go through Oklahoma City if you want young girls. And we developed that reputation. Some of it's the tribal issues here, but a lot of it has to do with the poverty here, the lack of ed education opportunities here, right. the violence and abuse against women and children here. We've been number one in child abuse. We're still number two in teen pregnancy. Um, we're, we're number two in homeless youth population. We're number one in getting kids going to bed hungry. They said we were 49th in education last year. We're 46th in per capita income. We have a lot of abuse against uh, women and children, and when a kid doesn't stay in school, they don't do well, then they don't do well in life. What I, I have had to learn so much in, in dealing with this. All of us that work with both are volunteers, and we do it out of the passion to try and help others. And some of us maybe know somebody that was taken advantage of, but others of us just learned about it and got on board. We have a lot of volunteers that help. One of our great partners, I mean, um, partners that are here today, we really highly value, but one of our other great partners is Youth Services, and they work with the runaway shelters. We have two million kids run away every year in America, a million of them are girls, running away from problems in the home or in their life. And in working with them, I found out the average age of a young person who gets out on their own, gets a job making money, paying their own bills, they finally are developing their own family, how old do you think that is in America when a young person is out of their own, making it on their own? What's the average you think? 24, 25, that's a really good guess. It's actually 27. Average age now in America when you're making it on your own is 27. So imagine you're 18, your family fell apart, you've been in the foster care system, and at 18, you 
just age out and you're on your own now to make it. And how do you imagine you're a runaway at 13, 14, 15, and you're out there trying to survive? How do you make it? And so uh, I, I'm a father of all daughters. I've so spoiled my daughters that no guy's going to be able to handle them. They don't cook, they don't clean, they don't do nothing. They lay around and get their nails done, and look beautiful. And so uh, I'm thinking, how would my daughter make it outside of the home if she ran away? And I don't know how they would make it. And it turns out these girls aren't making it. So within 24 hours, over half of them are propositioned. you got to trade to stay here. If you want to ride, you got to trade for it. Within 48 hours, three quarters of them have started doing survival sex to make it outside of the home. And half of those that start survival sex will end up being commercialized. So the estimates are now that 300,000 U.S. girls will move into the adult sex industry every year. They're underage. They're becoming the next generation prostitutes. But the way it started was when they were kids and teenagers. So we've started a new campaign here in Oklahoma called She's13.com. You've probably seen some of the billboards because the average age is about 12 and a half to 13 when the girl has her first pimp. She can't get away from him. She can't get free. He'll, he'll often try to impregnate her and be the pimp. Baby daddy and control her through her children. Uh, she'll lose, of course, her kids. She'll end up getting arrested. Uh, she'll have a criminal record. She'll go to drugs and alcohol to survive and cope to deal with all the trauma and abuse. And um, she won't be able to break free from it because she didn't finish her education. She doesn't have a family supporting her. She's got nobody wants her. Nobody cares about her. Everybody's taking advantage of her. She doesn't know how to get out of the lifestyle. So when she hits 18, most likely she'll become a stripper dancer or something just to survive. Uh, some of them make it out, and when they do, they just bury that past. They want to move forward, you know, build a family, try to forget about it, but the trauma is pretty intense. And it keeps them around. And some of them commit suicide. Uh, many of them become really strong survivors. They really get street tough. They really learn how to survive. They end up getting with gangs for survival. So there's a lot of different scenarios other than taken somewhere where someone's abducted and forced into this. That does happen, but it's about only 1% of the time. The bigger issue we have is recruiters. And so around the world, the recruiters are women. They recruit for traffickers because people trust women. Here in the United States, here in our area, number one recruiter is a boyfriend working for a gang or group or a camp, or it could be a Romeo pimp. The number two recruiter is a teenage girl. She's been recruited already victimized, brainwashed, and now to survive, she has to go find other young girls for them because the turnover rate is pretty, pretty intense. And so when we're thinking about what do we warn our kids about, stranger danger, don't get in the car with a stranger, beware of Freddie, you know, he's a bad guy. We're not really thinking about a boyfriend would set you up for this or a girlfriend would set you up for this. Who would think of that? <clears throat> One of the cases here in Oklahoma was a girl who raised the southern part of the state tribal girl, the Seminole tribe. Um, her family, she was good, you know, did good at school, played basketball, went to church. But her family fell apart. She went into the city and started staying with different people and started working out. Finally got with her grandmother, and that was a good fit. But then her grandmother died the next year, health-related issues, and she's back in the system and not doing well. And a boy says, hey, let's just run away and get away from all this. Life sucks here. Let's, let's find someplace better. And later that year, she was picked up in Lawson, where she was uh, being prostituted arrested and then at the end of the year started getting arrested in Oklahoma City at truck stop. Two years later, uh, at the age of 19, they found her body in Texas in a bar ditch, naked, beaten, tortured, it took them six months to identify her and try to tattoo. They finally figured out who she was and traced back to Oklahoma. Oklahoma was one of the leading states in murder truck stop prostitutes uh, and where they would pick them up and then dump them across the border. Uh, why? You know, what's, what's interesting about this young lady is that she was very smart, very brilliant, uh, very creative, and she would written a lot of poetry. And so when you Google her name, and, and her name is Casey Jo Pipestem, when you Google her name, you can see the poetry she wrote. She's being stuck in this world, trying to get out of it, the drugs issues, the customers, uh, praying for her mom and for a new life. I mean, here was a victim, and we never knew it was a victim because we had all thought she did it by choice. When we started understanding uh, some of the girls talking about what happened to them in the truck stops, and that's not the biggest problem, our biggest problem the hotel industry, but in the truck stops, uh, where we first learned about it, we started an organization called Truckers Against Truckers.
trafficking has gone nationwide. We're headquartered out of Denver now. We work with trucking companies. And we thought there's got to be some good guys that would help us find the girls. It turns out there's a lot of good guy truck drivers, and there's a couple teams of women drivers. And so we started having calls coming in. But when I'd be working at a trade show, truckers are talking about this issue, that they're not all bad girls. Some of them aren't there by choice. Some were abducted. Some family members are looking for them. None of them get paid for this. They have to give all their money to their controllers. We really started telling the story. We started saying, if they're looked young, would you call us so we can try to help them? Truckers would say, you know, Mark, we see these girls walking around the lot. We call them lot lizards. They come up and knock on our door. They bother us. They try to sell themselves. They're the bad girls. We're the good guys. And I said, well, I understand that, but how do you know? You know, what's the real story here? Who knows her story? And the interesting thing we've learned to do in society is we look at somebody and we make a really quick judgment based on how they're dressed or the color of their skin or the car they drive or, you know, uh, if we look at the younger generation and think their pants are too low or their skirt's too high or they've got tattoos, we think we know their story. You really don't know anybody's story until they open up and share their story with you just like they don't know your story. But when we look at people as a group, that, that gang or those skaters, or in this case, the girls being dropped off at the truck stops, it looked like they were wanting to do it. They were dressed for the parts. They were acting like they wanted to do it. But in reality, they were all forced to pull the turns out, uh, and the, the underage ones. So truckers started calling, and we started getting rescues. We have over two or 300 calls a year now coming in from the trucking industry, and drivers calling and helping alert us. We really changed how their thinking was, because before, they just never had any idea what the real story was behind this. We're going at the hotel industry next, working with our night clerks and missing Oklahoma girls. We hand out flyers missing Oklahoma girls. There's so many of them that are endangered youth right now. It's very challenging. So we have outreach programs. We're a new organization. We're trying to bring awareness about this. We're trying to re-educate all of culture, law enforcement, and everybody to re-understand this person is, if they're underage, they're not there by choice. They've been coerced. Someone's tricked them. And now they're stuck there and can't get out. Uh, they need to get back into education. They need to get their life back and get some control of their life and, and get some mental health if they need that and get some help with drugs. Uh, so we have the outreach programs for our runaway shelters and our girls' detention centers and our incarceration units. And we have this new campaign to educate others. And we have our first women's shelters open, one here in Oklahoma City and one in the Tulsa area for adult females that were caught up into it as kids and teenagers helping them get, get recovered. Uh, we're very proud of them. But we don't have anything for our teenage girls. And we have so many of them. Uh, we work with 13, 14, 15 year olds so often we don't have any place to put them. We try to place them in some other type of shelter. It just doesn't work. They bail out of that and back on the street. Uh, and so we're really trying to work building that up. We, we have been looking around the nation who's the best at it. Nobody's really very good at it right yet. But the, some of the best are using equine therapy. They use horses on a horse ranch and the girls connected to Animals. The therapist works through the animals and helps them stabilize their life and get them back in school. So we have really high hopes for that. A lot of horses need rescue. We have a problem with the horses in the nation right now. And so combining those two groups together, we're really looking for some problems. So that's where our effort is. Our number is 36707, and you're giving to help us get those homes open for the girls here in Oklahoma so that they can be in the recovery system. We don't know how many there are. We've worked with over 100 in the last uh, those are the ones that we found. They don't self-identify. They don't even know their victims. Often they're just trying to survive. And sometimes we find them afterwards, uh, later on. Uh, there was a girl here in the Oklahoma City area that her father started trading her for drugs when she was four uh, with multiple people until she was about 11 or 12. Uh, but by then she was so messed up. Uh, we actually took her out of the Dr. Phil show earlier this year. He reached out to her and tried to get her into the program. They got her into a program in Dallas and she didn't stay very long. And she's back out. I saw her the other day at a pizza place in Edmond. And she was trying to pawn a, a PlayStation. So uh, very, very challenged population because everybody in their life has betrayed them. And, and whoever guides them have taken advantage of them. And they're just been used and used and used. And they don't have any self value. And so we really got to create within our culture understanding of what's happened to them so that we can try to help them recover their lives and put their lives back together. Really appreciate your